I'm joined with uh, Mr. Anderson, Chris Anderson, CEO, co-founder of 3D Robotics. Hi. How's it going? Very well. You were, uh, we were just talking backstage how you're a sort of a uh, you know, fellow Brit, but a uh, Brit in disguise. Yeah, b born there, um, moved to the US. I, uh, when it's useful to claim to be British, like when I need a higher IQ, I'm <laughs> British, otherwise, American. Okay, so you know, we're on the same page, I guess. You know, we, we can relate. Um, we're here, obviously, to talk about uh, 3D Robotics. It's, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, is it 3D ro Robotics or 3D R? How are you going, what do you? We, uh, interestingly, we've gone, um, we started as 3D Robotics because drones are flying robots, but um, we're now we're 3D R because robots are things that don't work. The moment they work, you call right. them washing machines. So it's a little bit of uh, rebranding for like wiggle room for like you can, how, how you're gonna interpret what these things do. Uh, we think of it like KFC. You know, uh, no, uh, 3DR, the, the point is it's 3DR is the brand. Um, you know, we are, we've got to the point where these things are super easy to use. You just push a button. You don't even have to think about them as a robot. You know, nerds like us like robots, but regular people just like things that work. So I think we'll come on to more or less what you were speaking about in a minute. I'm kind of interested, so for anyone who doesn't know, you were, you were on this side of the fence uh, before you started 3D Robotics. I sat on that crack. <laughs> right. That's Sorry, I'm, I'm referring to the sofa. Right, this is a just private be, joke uh, that, that, that <laughs> worked before we went on air. But um, so yes, yeah, so you were you were at Wired. Um, how does one go from from Wired to making uh, washing machines or robots? <laughs> washing machines. I think my washing machine metaphor has run fully out of control now. Um, well, the answer. I mean, my joke is is the case of parenting gone horribly wrong. Uh, so I've got five kids, and um, I'm always trying to get them interested in science and technology. In 2007. We got this Lego Mindstorms robotics kit. And I said, kids, we're going to have this awesome weekend. And we're going to build a robot. And the kids like, you know, spent the weekend building the Lego robot. And they're like, it very slowly moves to a wall and then bounces back. And they're like, you've got to be kidding, right? We've seen Transformers. Where are the freaking lasers? Right, they, it looks so much cooler on the box. It's so much cooler on the box. And I was like, what would be more interesting than a very slowly moving robot? And I thought, a flying robot. And like, literally, I Googled flying robot. And the first result was drone. I'm like, huh, OK, I guess. Drones are flying robots. Then I Googled drone, and then the first result was autopilot. And I guess, OK, I guess that's the brain for the plane. That's how you, they fly. And then I Googled autopilot, and then there's like a, like a lot of math. So I kind of stopped Googling. And I just did it. And the kids and I built a, a Lego flying drone on the dining room table. The kids lost interest. I started a website called DIY Drones, which became the biggest drone community in the world. And which is still running, still which the is biggest still running uh, today. And, um, it just happened to be the right time. 2007 was the key year. That was the year that 3D printing came out and Arduino, the maker movement. Uh, the Wii controller came out with accelerometers and so the Fitbit guys got their start. But it was also the year the iPhone came out. And the reason I'm here today is because smartphone guts, you know, sensors and GPS and cameras and processors have made things like flying robots really easy so that even someone like me can do it. So, I mean, th that sounds pretty straightforward in terms of I understand your journey there, but I mean, there's lots of things I'm interested in that I go online and I search for them, you know, and I, I, I'd love to maybe work with them or something like that, but it's not, it's not just as easy as that, right? There's, you've got to have someone who knows these things or like... I had a, um, what I had, I, the one easy thing I did was set up a website. And then all the really smart people came out of the community. So they found, they were thinking about the same things. There was a place to go. They started you know, collaborating online with software and hardware. And I mean, you know, I, I call my, you know, I was kind of like, you know, as a cruise director, I mean, I, I have a degree in computational physics, so I mean, okay, so I, I know a little something about this. But the reality, the reality is, my skill here was identifying an opportunity, creating a place where smart people could collectively do something about it, and then realizing at a certain point that that community could become a company, and doing that. So it's interesting you mentioned that because um, I think one of the hallmarks of 3D robotics, 3D R. Um, compared to some of the other uh, drone companies, uh, is that, that you've, you've got a sort of an ethos of sharing or open source. And why, why take that route? So we are, we are the Android of UAVs. Um, we're an open platform. It's not 100% open source, but it's very much modeled after Android, open APIs, drone, phone, cloud, et cetera. Why do we take that route? Well, I'll give you a sort of cheeky answer. Because it's 2016, it's like it's obvious that open innovation is the way to go. That platforms beat products. That no one company can do it all. 
in Silicon Valley, the notion of, of being an open platform is kind of it's kind of straightforward. Um, and the question is not why did we choose the open innovation group, but why is, did everyone else not? And has that um, has that approach paid dividends? Has, has it come back and, and so you've you've given something out to the community, and then the community's taken it, improved it, made it better. Yeah, so it has paid dividends in a number of ways. So it's, uh, the platform, the software, is adopted by about 750,000 people out there, including mostly companies, you know, products that we don't make. So that's good. Adoption's good. Uh, number two is innovating very quickly, and so we have we still build something called the Drone Code Project, part of the Linux Foundation, and so Qualcomm and Intel and you know Box and our competitors like Parrot and Unique are all part of this, and they're all collectively adding little bits and pieces. That are you know that we could not do ourselves, so that's all good. Um, where it's tricky is that we're competing with a company called DJI. And heard so of them? You heard of them? So they 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 took the Apple approach, which is that it's a pretty much a closed platform. There's a little it's like an App Store version, but it's largely a closed platform, beautifully integrated, and it's great. And we're taking the Android approach. Now our bet is that the Android approach. So Android today has 84 percent of the world's market, but you could argue that Apple has the majority of the profit at least in the handset you know, business. And that's okay with us. We would rather create a huge market and take a minority share of the, of the economics than try to do it, everything ourselves. But it's early days. So to make it clear to people who, who don't really know or maybe don't quite understand what the open source uh, model means, but it's, it means that you can introduce features, um, software features that you guys develop, they're developed in-house, but you effectively give away the information that allows other people who Homebrew or other, even other companies, competitors really, I guess, conceal this and integrate that same feature into their own core culture, their own drone. Uh, absolutely, we, and we make it super easy. We have SDKs and APIs, and it's all you know, GPL and BSD and things like that. Um, so if you want a flying drone, take our software. You know, use clone hardware if you want; it'll work great. If you want the drone to talk to your phone. Well, then you're probably going to end up using some of our proprietary stuff called 3DR services. If you want it to talk to the cloud, then you're getting much deeper into our proprietary stack. So the answer is we make it really easy for people to create a kind of a simple drone. But as, as it goes beyond the drone into the data and the cloud and you get this full stack approach, you tend to get pulled into our ecosystem. So, because um, the, the one I always think of when I think of you guys is follow, follow me or follow smart follow, which is pretty much like a standard default feature now. Yep. Um, but what are the sort of ones that you're working on now that, or, uh, that are either the ones that are just coming out or what's, what's the sort of the hot thing? Yeah, so, so, we, so the, what defines a drone is autonomy, which is to say it's got GPS and sensors and things like that. So what's autonomy good for? Well, on the consumer side, autonomy is good for doing things you couldn't do yourself, flying, taking off, landing, return to home, things like that. Um, the next thing is, okay, now you're not c concerned about the drone, you want to get a video. You want to get cinematic video. Well, what does cinematic aerial video mean? Well, it's not just putting a camera in the sky. It turns out there's a right way and a wrong way to, to pan and reveal and orbit and things like that smoothly. And So I don't know anything about that. I'm not a Hollywood director. Um, but software knows how to become a Hollywood director. So we, uh, this week, we're announcing a number of new cinematic features. One of them is called multi-point cable cam. So what you do is imagine, imagine that um, you're, like, you're shooting a movie, right? And there's the primary camera, and you're going to put a human behind that camera. But you also want the secondary cameras, and you want them to kind of like robotically go up, go around this path, because you know movies are all pre-vis, etc. And then you want it to absolutely do the same path every time, totally repeatable, all timed. And maybe three drones do that, or four drones. So that's on the Hollywood set. Now imagine you could do this yourself. You say, look, um, I'm going to, I'm going to be playing soccer with my kids, and I, this is the shot I would like Football. to see. Sorry. Football. Uh, Football, or even football. <laughs> um, this is the shot that would be awesome. I want it to go up, I want it to come around here, I want it to pan around and then pull away. And by the way, I want to be in front of the camera. I want to be in the shot. That's what a multi-point cable can do. We create a virtual cable in the sky and it smoothly goes into that, flies around and completely repeatable. And then I push the button and now I'm the actor in my movie, not the cameraman. And it is this, so this is open source, you've, you've, or is this, so I was going to say, because this brings me on to, you're talking about Solo, which is right. your, uh, would you say, a flagship drone or your flagship consumer product? It's our flagship drone. It's both consumer and enterprise. But yeah, so that, that particular feature, multi-point cable cam, and we have a bunch of others, orbits and follows and things like that, those are proprietary features built on an open platform.
Uh, would you ever open source them at some point? Uh, well, you can absolutely, we absolutely open source the tools to do it. But the particular algorithms that make this really smooth, um, no, we probably won't open source that. We'll definitely encourage other people to make their own. But, you know, so we'll offer a sort of a simple way to do things like follow me. But really, really good follow me, that's probably going to be ours. Okay, so you, you're like, you're given a framework, but they've got to put the br bricks and the, the cement on themselves. It, you know. It's just like Android. If you want, you know, basic, the, the basic video pipeline Android, you know, the basic operating system, that, that's great. If you want to, uh, you know, compete with um, you know, Google Maps, well, you tur it turns out there's this Google services layer that you don't have access to, et cetera. So, we, you know, of course, we're going we're gonna to be mostly open, but we're going to retain some elements of proprietary technology that show off what we do the best. Uh, and Soda really is a drone for, for video, for filming, isn't it? That is, without a doubt, it's not like, oh, it does, I mean, it, you can use it for other things, I'm sure, but you built it with that in mind, right? We built Solo initially for what's called smart shots, which is to get sort of, to, you know, so like step one, get the robot to fly, check. Step two, put a camera on it, check. Step three, actually make a great video, not so easy. Um, and so this notion of a, a shot library, this notion of taking the, the sort of uh, the, uh, the artistic skill set of Hollywood and putting it into software, that became, that became the selling point of Solo, and that's called the smart shots. But what gets really interesting is when you move beyond the consumer context into, into enterprise. And so what we announced with uh, Autodesk um, uh, late last year, and we're gonna release as a product very soon, is to be able to do mapping and scanning with the same drone, just different software, push a button, scan the world, the imagery goes to the cloud, shows up as a 3D model or 2D model automatically. So this sort of thing is the, um, everyone knows about drones, they fly, you can take videos with them, etc. cetera, but uh, there, there is that whole other side, that, um, the, the enterprise side that you talk about, and mapping, for example, is a really, really good example, isn't it? Because um, there, there's technologies now, uh, I think, is it four, I, can't, I forget their name, it escaped, escaped four pix, four pixel, but they do mapping software that uses one drone, but it, can, it goes back and forth. Yeah, or and, that would be, be called Solo. <laughs> well, as well. But uh, so they can generate 3D images right. from, from one camera, and, and this is something that's gonna be um, kind of a big boost to, to a whole bunch of industries. Absolutely, so right now we're working with Autodesk and things like construction sites. So construction sites, so Autodesk makes all the software that people use to design a, a site, then the moment you dig the first you know, shovel of dirt, it's analog. You know, it's no longer digital, and now you've lost the ability to monitor it. So Autodesk has a, has a project called Reality Capture. And that, what you do is you start digital, it becomes analog, then you re-digitize it with cameras, and those cameras are in drones, and then you turn it into a, a 3D or 2D model that goes right back into the same CAD file that you started with, and then you can monitor the progress. And so, so you have construction sites today that have drones flying every day, the exact same, plat, uh, same path, taking the exact same photos, and you can watch the thing building up over time and spot where it's going off plan or where it's behind plan, things like that. So I know you, um, you have partnerships as well with other companies, Qualcomm. Qualcomm's an investor. Okay, so tell us a bit more about your relationship with Qualcomm and what it actually means for for drones. So I mentioned at the beginning of our conversation that the reason I got into this is because the iPhone and other smartphones made the, the, the core technologies easy, cheap, powerful, accessible. So we bet on, so the original aerospace industry thought that drones were like airplanes minus pilots. And we decided that they were gonna be smartphones with propellers. And so every bet we make basically sort of says, where is the flow of the silicon? Where are things, where's Moore's law moving the fastest? And the answer is in your pocket. Um, with smartphone technology. What's going on with smartphone cameras is amazing. With video pipelines, you know, the wireless communications, the battery life, the processors. You know, the, the, uh, the Snapdragon processor that, that we and others are using, that's the power of a Cray 2. It's amazing, it's a supercomputer in your pocket. So we're like, okay, we're going to basically use smartphone technology in an aerospace context. And so we partnered with, uh, so we took investment from Qualcomm and we're standardizing on the, the Snapdragon platform, which has to do with things like computer vision, sense and avoid, um, really, really a powerful uh, long distance wireless stacks, things like that. So, um, again, Qualcomm investment and enterprise, that's all good. But what about me? I like to fly. You know, what, what are these sort of innovations? What, what's the sort of trickle down that I'm going to see in the next uh, five years, whatever? Yeah, sense and avoid is the big one. So right now, um, you know, you take a drone in the air and people say, terrific, how do you do that? And so, you know, originally you said, hey, I learned skills and I use sticks. And then you say, well, then I push a button and they say, oh, that's amazing. Um, how does it avoid trees? And the answer is it doesn't. 
It hits trees. Um, it's like, well, well, when's it gonna be smart enough to avoid trees? And the answer is, well, how, how well? We can avoid, every, every one of us can avoid some things some of the time. But can we avoid all things all the time? That's called scene awareness, sense and avoid. And that's the same problem that autonomous cars are trying to solve. And it is a really hard problem to do, you know, telephone lines, things like that. So um, you need cameras, you need radar, you need LIDAR, you need infrared, you need sonar, you need all of the above going in all directions. And the ability to fuse all that data and come up with a, a real-time sense of the world around you so granular that you would avoid a telephone line all the time, that's, that's the hard problem. And the reason you want this is because, you know, this, this, the droid you are looking for is this, oh, like, you. Is this, is this little robot that just minds its own business. That you don't have to fly it. It just figures out a way to get the job done. Now maybe for you it's video, or maybe for security it's following you around. In an enterprise context, it's mapping and scanning. But the point is, is that it doesn't need GPS. If you got GPS, great. But like you, you can navigate CES with your eyes. That was a two million years of evolution. And we're gonna try to do that in about two years. In about two years. So are you su suggesting that maybe the next product the next Solo, Solo 2 or Duo, whatever you want to call it, I'll let you have that one for free. Um, it's gonna have these, this sort of technology. Absolutely. In, um, in 20, uh, so 2015, all drones had GPS and some autonomy. 2016, all drones are gonna have Linux and you know, sort of more and more advanced AI. Um, by the end of 2016, I would expect, or 2017, CS 2017, I would expect that most of the drones you see here will have some ability to navigate without GPS. And um, I think we've, we're sort of going to wrap up, so just one more thing. You said you've only had a quick look at the drones. There's plenty of them here. Tell me what your favorite thing is. Um, so uh, my favorite one was a, um, a company, uh, so aside from our own, um, we're not actually demonstrating here except for in the Qualcomm booth. Um, there's a company called uh, ZeroTech. Um, weirdly, in China, it's uh, with a Z. Here, it's uh, X, X-I-R-O. Okay. And they have this uh, adorable little drone with folding arms that uses a Snapdragon chip. I don't even know what it's called yet, but it, it comes in like a little a little bag, and it, it's it's super cute. It's small, it's light, it's safe. It's got Snapdragon. I love it. Does it have a camera? Oh yeah. Okay, and um, I think that's about pretty, like I said, that's all we got time for. Pretty excited to see what you're doing next with 3DR. Thanks for coming along and joining us. Thank you. Okay, guys, and uh, you might want to hang around because coming up next we've got David Polk and Engadget Editor in Chief uh, Michael Gorman. Thank you very much. <laughs>